Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Senator Tillis, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you. I think you've done an extraordinary job with the oversight on this matter and appreciate uh, your willingness to do that. You know, we've gathered a lot of very important information uh, through these hearings. And uh, Secretary Call, I I'd like to, I think it would be helpful. I like the fact that uh, you support an independent commission, but I think it would also be helpful as that ramps up for our committee to uh, compile a bipartisan comprehensive report on what we've all learned uh, through these oversight hearings. So can I get your commitment to work with the minority and majority staff to put such a report together? You have my commitment to provide you the information you need for that effort. Um, General Mingus, uh, and when we talk about the 2,500 troop and, and uh, Secretary Call, I may come back to you if I have time, but um, I think that we need to understand more broadly what I, I believe. I just want to confirm uh, that I have my facts correct. Uh, General Miller, Millie, McKenzie have all said that there was a, a consensus that with 2,500 troops uh, that we could maintain a relatively stable situation. Nothing's guaranteed. But weren't we, in fact, talking about 2,500 uh, fighters, uh, the intelligence community largely remaining in place in Afghanistan, and another almost 6,000 uh, troops from our NATO partners and allies. So we're talking somewhere on the order of about uh, maybe 8,000, 8,500 being present in Afghanistan. Is that roughly the numbers? If the NATO coalition contractors, civilians would have stayed consistent, sir, yes, that number is is. Uh, accurate. And that would have been our ISR assets, our strike capabilities, all the other things that would be inherent with that sort of troop presence. Those ISR assets, that actually was inside, uh, largely inside the 2,500, but then there was, uh, from a strike perspective, that you had both uh, assets in Afghanistan and from uh, the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, uh, Senator uh, King, I have been against the Doha Agreement since September, or since February the 29th. I thought it was a bad idea. It was fundamentally flawed, and I'm not surprised where we are today. But I do have to question. It seems to me, based on briefings that, that we've received, that there were a number of examples since the signing of the agreement where the Taliban is either did not live up to the letter or the spirit of the agreement. I think one thing that we heard consistently is that they were doing targeted attacks of uh, Afghan national leadership, uh, which was one of the destabilizing influences over the, with respect to the eroding confidence in the Afghan national forces. Uh, um, General Mingus, you said that they have generally honored the agreement, or it may have been Secretary Call, but I can tell you in two real-life examples where they haven't in terms of allowing people to leave. They slit the throat of a pregnant woman, <coughs> excuse me, that we were working on to get out who had, uh, she was in, I think, the P1 category. They also slit the throat. We have pictures that family members ultimately sent to us, two of the 900 people that we have on a list that we're still trying to get people out of the country. So, the Taliban may be doing a better job in the marketing department, but we know every single day people are dying there that, that have a legitimate reason to be out of the country. Uh, so with respect to the, the broader agreement, though, can you give me other examples? You said they've generally adhered to the terms of the Doha agreement. Can you give me a couple of examples where that's not the case? I apologize if I misspoke. I meant they had only complied with one of the many, and that was... Okay. Largely uh, not attacking U.S. forces during, since the Doha. Agreement. Okay, so all they, the others they were in clear violation. I'm glad to hear that because that's yeah. consistent with what uh, General Milley testified yes, to a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so we can't say that the agreement did not have terms or did not have conditions, uh, and they broke that. So now, Secretary Call, I want to go back to you. You. Um, you testified before that uh, some of the decisions or the recommendations of the remaining 2,500 troops predated your uh, uh, your confirmation. But after you were confirmed, were you briefed on that? And to what extent uh, did the did these discussions or to what extent did these proposals even get considered when we saw the eroding process occurring in Afghanistan? Or were that was it pretty much covered ground at that point, not considered by the time you got it there uh, got in at the end of April? Uh, so th by the time I got in, the decision had been made by the president and the department was executing on that uh, decision. 
Uh, there was not a, a major relitigation of, of kind of reversing course. I think as you heard from General Miller in closed uh, briefing to you, in his view, once we did the retrograde, because we were already so small, so compact, speed was safety. Uh, so we really had the bulk of the retrograde done by the beginning of July. Uh, the remaining mission was to protect the embassy, which is why we concentrated at the embassy compound and then a few hundred troops at HKIA. We did put in a couple hundred additional troops to assist with close air support uh, in the July-August time frame as the Taliban was making gains. Uh, but that was essentially a short-term measure. Um, uh, we were still, this plan was still to stick to the August 31st date, and that was not relitigated uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and thank you. And uh, Secretary Call, I look forward to uh, our committee being able to compile a report based on what we've learned through these oversight hearings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, Senator Warren, please. Uh, 